Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America, joined by Jim Garrity of National Review. He's also the author of the forthcoming The Weed Agency, due out in early June. Get your advanced copies ordered as soon as possible. We've got good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. And Jim, we start with the good news, and uh, this came down yesterday from the Supreme Court. Greece, New York, not Greece the country, was uh, before the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. The issue at hand was, should they be allowed to have prayers to open their meetings, particularly if those prayers generally have a Christian tone to them, which seems to be the predominant faith of the community up there in New York. By a 5-4 to four decision, the Supreme Court has decided, yes, in fact, they can continue to have an invocation at the beginning of their meetings, even if they tend to invoke Christianity. Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, says that this has been a part of the tradition of the United States all the way back to the First Continental Congress. And the uh, critical sentence here, the town of Greece does not violate the First Amendment by opening its meetings with prayer that comports with our tradition and does not coerce participation by non-adherence. A little troubling that they only got this done by one vote, Jim, but uh, it's good to see that the free exercise clause is still alive and somewhat well. There is even a little bit more good news to this in that even though there was a slight disagreement on how you interpret it, all nine endorsed the concept of legislative prayer. Uh, and the four dissenters agreed that public forums need not become a religion-free zone, in the words of Justice Selena Kagan. So that's that's the really good news. This is one of those areas where my colleague Jonah Goldberg likes to talk about the hidden law, kind of the, the kind of a little frustrating that we needed to have this literally litigated all the way up to the top of the Supreme Court. If you're running a town council or city council or something like that, and you'd like to begin your session with a prayer, never mind constitution or legality, it seems like it's a good idea to try to make it as welcoming to everybody as possible. That doesn't mean it has to be, you know, you have to definitely be non-denominational. It doesn't mean, you know, you can't use Christ or something specific. But nonetheless, I think that's ruled in the past that, you know, you can't like say, well, we're not, you know, we're only going to have this religion give prayers. We're not going to allow other folks. If somebody else wants to offer uh a rotation, you know, we've seen uh, Muslim imams and Jewish rabbis and all kinds of groups open up Congress for the prayer. Try to be welcoming to everybody. Try to allow everybody to have their say. Don't denounce the heathens, <laughs> the other religions and things like that. But then the next thing is, is let's say you're at some city council meeting and somebody says something in the prayer you don't like. Do you literally need to litigate this all the way up to the Supreme Court? Hearing things you don't want to hear is kind of at the concept of a city council meeting. If all of us decide to file lawsuits the moment somebody said something offensive, well, I guess maybe that's what we're headed to in our culture these days. All of a sudden, the right to not be offended has become preeminent, and in some uh, jurisdictions seems to outweigh the First Amendment right to speak your mind. But nonetheless, it's nice to see a court decision go our way for once, and that the idea that, you know, Something that strikes me as an unbelievably minor issue to get upset about. We are allowed to continue and permit, at least until this comes up before the Supreme Court again, and then we'll see if it goes 5-4 or the other way. Well, take what we can get right now. There haven't been a lot of Supreme Court decisions that we've liked lately. And given how our founders got to this country and the issues that drove them here from England, it's nice to see that religious freedom uh, has been defended, at least at this stage, at the highest court in the land. But as you mentioned, it's a little bit sad that it even had to get that far. All right, on to a martini number two now, the bad martini now. Jim, if we still use the term global warming, we are so old school. Now climate change isn't even cool anymore. Climate disruption is how the administration is rolling out its new anti-climate disruption agenda. And it's going to, of course, bypass Congress. They want to raise more fuel standards. They want to invoke more uh, draconian regulations under the Clean Air Act and all sorts of other things. They obviously know Republicans in the House uh, certainly aren't going to go along with this, so they're not even going to bother trying to work with Congress on this. So we'll see if they're eventually going to try and implement cap and trade unilaterally. As you discovered today in the Washington Post, however, the good news is it turns out that cow flatulence is a bigger threat to our long-term health here on the planet than the Keystone Pipeline. So uh, I guess we know where the next extermination plot's going to come. <laughs> well, you know the vegans are already coming after us on this one, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I would also like to remind listeners that this is a very classy podcast, and thus there will be no sound effects <laughs> during this discussion of cow flatulence, uh, not even any mooing. The environmentalists are up in arms about the Keystone Pipeline. 
they're citing global warming. I think basically the easiest way of saying we say no, they just don't like oil use. Unfortunately, oil is kind of basic to the not just fuel in cars, but plastics and and heat home heating and, and all, like we, we are a oil based society. And even though we're developing other forms of, of you know uh, sources of energy. The idea of us being an oil-free society is is decades, if not centuries, away. So you really can't argue that, well, we can't build the Keystone Pipeline because of climate change. It's less than 0.3% of annual Keystone emissions uh, as a share of all U.S. uh, emissions. Worth noting on the administration's thing, this is a really, you know, look, this this continues this whole idea of this lawless president that doesn't really want to work with Congress anymore throwing up his hands in frustration and saying, the hell with it, I'm just going to do things my way. I'm going to ignore the Constitution. I'm going to ignore Congress. I'm going to try to get what I want. Now, one of the points that I love to put forth to environmentalists and the folks who are are tearing their hair out about climate change, I, unlike some of my colleagues, I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge the possibility that if you've got 7 billion people on Earth doing things that emit carbon, that's going to be a higher level than when it was 6 billion, than when it was 5 billion, than when it was 4 billion. Could that affect the environment? Sure. I think it's a little less, you know, direct, straight line, clear than they'd like to connect. But sure, we've got more people doing more things that will emit more carbon into the atmosphere. However, once you recognize this, short of global thermonuclear war wiping out several billion people, there aren't really many ways to move the emissions in the opposite direction. And my best statistic that cites all this, and this is from the EPA data, this is not some crazy right winger coming us that if you eliminated the entire Western Hemisphere, never mind that we reduced our emissions, never mind if we all went back to the Stone Age and we never did it, you know, we never started fires or anything like that, even if we just kind of grazed on grass, even if we just, you know, ceased to exist, would that reduce carbon dioxide emissions? Sure, for a while. But within 10 years, China would have increased its emissions uh, so much that it would be moved to be back up again. So even if we had a magic wand that could wipe out the entire Western Hemisphere, it would not do any good, and we'd end up there. So, if you believe that humans are emitting are increasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, that's going to happen one way or the other. And I just put up on campaign spot. There are a bunch of ways this is actually good news. We're going to have longer growing seasons. It's going to open up the Northwest Passage. And it's going to open up possibilities of uh, not just energy resources up there, but fresh water. Nobody wants to hear about that because this isn't really about the science. It's about religion. It's about we've been mean to Great Gaia in the sky or in the ground, and um, we need to be punished for our sins, and thus President Obama will probably fly around the country in Air Force One <laughs> telling the rest of us to use less carbon. Now that he's rolling out this aggressive uh, climate disruption agenda, Jim, do you think he'll quietly approve the pipeline? Do you think he's still going to wait till after the midterms uh, so yeah. red state Democrats can use it as a crutch? Uh, how do you expect him to play that now? Safe to say no decision is going to come before November, because if he does, then, you know, Mary Landrieu can't brag about how hard she's been fighting the administration and cajoling them on the on the pipeline. Uh, Rolling Stone reported that he's already made the decision. The decision is no. When you've not said yes for five years, you've already <laughs> effectively said no. Yeah. And my suspicion, there, there you go. if Obama wanted to approve the pipeline, he would have done it by now. And so now the question is, how does he say no in a way that, that damages his party as little as possible? Proponents have, have two really good arguments here. One is that the pipeline is a good idea. It's good for our energy usage. It's going to create jobs. You know, The carbon emission is going to be negligible. But the other second thing is if you're going to say no, then say no and take the political hit. None of this, you know, perpetual delay uh, limbo land that uh, keeps, you know, that, that's a way of saying no without accepting the consequences. Take responsibility for your decisions, but that's ultimately not what this presidency is about. All right, on to the crazy martini now. And uh, it's a year of action, uh, the president, of course, has declared uh, since the beginning of the year because. 2013 was a a debacle, of course, and he's got many different ideas for what the year of action should look like, uh, the minimum wage, extending unemployment uh, insurance. uh, But Jim is on the campaign spot, uh, put together a nice little nugget about just how much action the president's actually engaging in. On Saturday, President Obama enjoyed his 11th golf outing of the year before heading off to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Today, the president meets with President Ismail Omar Guella of Djibouti, and then hosts a Cinco de Mayo reception at the Rose Garden. Later this week, he will attend four Democratic fundraisers in California. So, Jim, you follow that up with the poll we talked about yesterday, and Americans not at all pleased with the direction the country is going. So if this is the idea of the president's uh, year of action, maybe inaction is the best thing for all of us. That was his weekly address. It says right there, the president's year of action. I, like you, Greg, I, I really hadn't noticed um, <laughs> that this, this year of action 
looks a lot like last year, which I guess was I, I missed the proclamation that it was a year of inaction. Um, because you know, <laughs> depending on how you define action, like golfing and fundraisers, then yeah, so Obama's been a very active president really since day one, and he's keeping it up every year of this presidency. Uh, in terms of getting bills passed, it's been very, very ineffective. And then the next aspect of this is that Obama's, well, he's trying to do everything he can through executive orders and through regulations instead of the legislative process because it's too hard. We all know how cooperative uh, the Republican Congress was with Bill Clinton. Uh, we all know how well Newt and Bill Clinton got along. We all know how Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan um, had were totally aligned in their viewpoints. Uh, Nixon and Congress, you, know, you know, the problem is Obama's the first president to ever have people in Congress who disagree with him. Thus, compromise is impossible and getting a deal is impossible. And the year of action is just kind of a, a good example of this hype. What's really kind of intriguing is, is two aspects of this. The first is that David Remnick of The New Yorker was on Morning Joe today, and apparently he said that, you know, Obama is disappointed in the world. I had joked that after the 2010 midterms, Obama would address the country and say, America, I am really deeply disappointed in you, in the form of a, a stern father who we had let down by not voting the way he had wanted us to. In a way, he, he didn't give that speech, thankfully. But since then, you know, as they said, you know, he's disappointed in the Republicans in Congress. He's disappointed in Bashir Assad. He's disappointed in Vladimir Putin. The first thing is that it's intriguing that either Remnick or Obama believe that anybody cares that Obama is disappointed in them. Secondly, just what kind of high hopes did he have, particularly for Putin and Assad? It's as if the man never met anyone or never had any interaction, any, any familiarity with these types of people in his life before he ended up in the Oval Office. And he's kind of shocked to learn that, you know, ooh, ooh, Assad lies and Putin lies and, and Putin is ambitious and, and, you know, all these problems. And, you know, he seems to be continually shocked. That Republicans, you know, have a very different idea of what the role of government is. And, you know, he keeps insisting the debate is settled and then the polls say no, <laughs> no, it's not. Or, or you could argue, based on how the poll numbers for Obamacare don't change, that indeed the, the, the debate is settled, Greg, and it's that the public doesn't like it. <laughs> Those numbers aren't going to change. He just seems kind of at a loss, and you're starting to see this kind of uh, tone of the coverage. We talked about Maureen Dowd. Peggy Noonan had a really good column this weekend talking about Obama seeming bored as president and disengaged and kind of recognizing that the end is near. The midterms look like they're going to be bad for him. Now, the only question is just how bad it's going to be. Those final two years could be with him you know, fighting a hostile Senate as well as a hostile House. But he can keep trying to do stuff through regulation and through executive orders and things like that, except... If Republicans get the White House in you know, January 2017, they can undo all that stuff themselves. He's establishing a precedent here that's really dangerous for his agenda, and it all stems from his basically inability that you know, he's concluded that Boehner and Cantor and uh, Mitch McConnell and these guys are just so untenable that he could never work with them at the same time he's reaching out to the Iranians. Jim, on that exciting and encouraging note, we'll leave it there for today. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And join us again Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.